she used to live at. Yeah. Hold it up there close. Well, they didn't hear you. Yeah. Are we ready, guys? Well, good evening. How's everybody? All right. Good to see you out tonight. All right. Let's begin with a word of prayer, could we? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the beautiful day you blessed us with, the time with you and this morning and your people. We've come back again tonight, Lord, just to worship you in song and also to study your word together. So, Lord, I just pray that uh, you would meet our needs as we would gather and we would meet your needs of worshiping you, Lord. Uh, you don't have to have us, but you've decided you've created us for fellowship with you, and I'm so thankful. So I uh, just pray you'd, you'd uh, be blessed and honored in our worship of you tonight. Be with the many needs about us to, this week, Father. I know there are many hospitals and care facilities and still some COVID situations around. And the other needs, Father, that are very dire. So I pray you'd meet them. So we love you, Lord. We praise you so much for just who you are. You're our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lord and King. And so we ask all this in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 All right. Now for a call to worship, the choir's really, really doing it. But y'all are welcome to sing along with us. It's 102. There's something about that name. Tyler, you can take the words up if you want. Um, we're going to sing through it, and then we've got a recitation, and then we're going to sing through it again. So. <laughs> At the name of Jesus, I've seen sin-hardened men melted, derelicts transformed, the lights of hope put back into the eyes of a hopeless child. At the name of Jesus, hatred and bitterness turn to love and forgiveness, arguments cease. I've heard a mother softly breathe his name at the bedside of a child delirious from fever. And I've watched that little body grow quiet and the fevered brow cool. I've sat beside a dying saint, her body racked with pain, who in those final fleeting seconds summoned her last ounce of ebbing strength to whisper Earth's sweetest name, Jesus, Jesus. Emperors have tried to destroy it. Philosophers have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the earth with the very blood of those who claimed it, yet still it stands. And there shall be that final day when every voice that has ever uttered a sound, every voice of Adam's race, shall raise in one bright, great, mighty chorus to proclaim the name of Jesus. 
For in that day every knee shall bow and every tongue con shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Ah, so you see, it was not mere chance that caused the angel one night long ago to say to a virgin maiden, His name shall be called Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know there is something about that name. Blessed be the name. I want to stand. You can't. You don't want to sit. You can't. I want to hear you singing out there. faithfulness and how you've blessed us. Father, we just pray that you'll continue to be with those that need you in a special way, those that have sickness in their lives and those who have 
other things going on in their lives, Father, that need you. I just pray that you'll minister to them through your Holy Spirit. And Father, as we um, have received our offerings today, we just pray that you'll bless those offerings, that they might be used to upbuild your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How can be seated? Oh, y'all already seen it. in the white hymn book. And did you see it up there? Did you see it all right? <laughs> all right, so it's in our other hymn book, but it's a different melody. So for our basses, anybody else that wants to sing a part, it's 309. 309 in our white hymn book. <laughs> Words will be up there for you, so.
This is an older song, but it's a little different <coughs> arrangement.
There's no sweeter name, amen? Amen. Jesus, you can't ever go wrong with songs about Jesus, can you, church? Brother Randy, sometimes he doesn't know what I'm preaching on when he's choosing the songs. So I say just anything about Jesus will be fine. <laughs> yeah. All right, if you would turn with me to Revelation 7 as we continue here. It's our mini-series, I guess, or it may end up in a maxi, I'm not sure, according to how the Lord leads. But Revelation chapter 7, verses again, 1 through 17. There's 17 verses in these two chapters, aren't there? All right, when you find your place, or if you'd like to look on the screen, if you would stand in honor of reading God's Word tonight. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen, amen. Good to be here with you guys. I love you. All right, Revelation 7, beginning in verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Aser were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Manassas were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of, tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, and honor and power and might, be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence they came they? And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them into living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Mm. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. May God add his Blessing, the reading and the hearing of his word. The remnant of Israel sealed, and of course that's just the beginning of this passage, or the part of this passage, the sealing, the sealing. Of course, uh, where else do you remember the word being sealed for believers in the New Testament that you hear me talk about all the time? What happens when you hear the gospel and believe and put your trust in the Lord? What does he do for you? Sealed you with the Holy Spirit, didn't he? Which is earnest of our inheritance until the day of he, he comes for us. So here he's going to be sealing some others. God has a, as we've talked, and as you know, God has a remnant of the true regeneration. Either in, well, I'm, I'm sure he has a remnant in his people Israel. He's got a remnant in the Gentiles as well. We know that remnant sometimes is small, just like in the days of Noah. There's a small remnant wasn't there. Days of Lot, just he and his wife and daughters, right? 
with only one saved. And of course, Lot's wife, you know, she turned back and looked and disobeyed and turned into a pillar of salt. But we see that God saves a remnant of every, every generation, really. And uh, I thank God for the remnant of our young people today. There are some good godly kids in their, in their midst today. And I know that the bad ones give the good ones a bad rap, don't they? But we know there's some good godly people, and we know there's some in our congregation as well, and I thank God for them. So here as we look at this passage, it said, after these things, uh, we talked about the wrath of God this morning, beginning the wrath where the seals were opened and, and all the different seals represented a different type of judgment and wrath of God upon planet earth and upon creation. And so it says, for the great day of his wrath is come, who shall be able to stand? And that is the last of chapter 6. So chapter 7 will begin. After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth. Notice here that God is still in charge, is he not? God is orchestrating all these events. Some people think this is the devil doing all these things, but God's orchestrating this stuff. He's uh, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So here we see another angel God has sent forth with a seal. Now some people look at that as maybe a mark, a seal in the forehead. And, it, and I think scripture talks about that. But uh, every time I think about seal, I think it's about the sealing of the Holy Spirit. And so he's sealing these folks. Now these these are a remnant. These are about to talk about that. They're 12,000 of the tribes of Israel that God has reserved in the end times. And so here they have come forth. They've come forth out of tribulation. Uh, we know that as we talk this morning, there's coming a day, as Zechariah tells us in the Old Testament, they'll see him whom they pierced, and they'll grieve and mourn, and they'll realize that this Jesus they crucified was actually the Messiah God sent for them. But their eyes are still veiled at this time as a whole. There are a lot of Jewish people who are being saved. But as a whole, the nation, their eyes are still veiled. It's, it's see that this angel is, is there uh, with that seal. And of course, there are four angels that are holding the winds and the judgment that God's about to send by these four angels. All right, and so he's, he's saying, he tells these, this angel, this whole, these angels are holding the wind. It says, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So he is sealing them in the forehead. And uh, still this could be a, a physical appearance of a seal. But I believe it still represents a sealing of the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, so he's, he's holding their hands, holding their, their forms of judgment to turn loose the winds. He said, until all my servants are sealed and prepared for this time. All right. And so then he moves on into verse 9. There's another group of people here. They're standing before the throne. After this I beheld. And keep in mind that John is seeing all this take place. He's in the spirit, but he's in heaven. He's able to see all these things that God is doing. That he's sending forth on the earth. So John is in heaven spiritually and he's looking down on planet earth as God is orchestrating all these things just imagine how that would how that would be to John John loves the Lord but John loves the people too of course we know that uh, the the church before this time has been raptured out but as we talked also and as you know there will be people saved during the tribulation time this is in the middle of the great tribulation that we're talking about right now Okay, all right, so he says, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, an innumerable crowd of people here, folks, uh, that's in the presence of God. They're from all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So here they are. See the scene in heaven again. Get this, get this in your mental picture of your mind. The scene in heaven. God on his throne. Jesus at the right hand of the Father. 
and all the seraphims and cherubims, whoever they are, all the created beings there in heaven that are going around with their wings covering and flying and, and crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, day and night without any interruption. And here we see a great number of people around the throne this is, that we can't number. Uh, that's good to know, isn't it, church? All right, and let's see who these people are. And it tells that they're from all nations, all kindreds, all people, all tongues. There are going to be people there from all nations. And they're before the Lamb, before the throne and before the Lamb. And they're clothed with white robes. And what did we say that the, robe, the white robes represent? The righteousness of Jesus. See, when you're, you're saved, you're clothed with his righteousness. God sees you as righteous, doesn't he? He declares you righteous, even though we're not practically, but we are positionally. Okay, So they're there with white robes and palms in their hands. So they're there just like they were when they ushered Jesus in to the city of Jerusalem, remember? Had the palms in their hands, laid down the palms on the, on the ground, their clothes on the ground, on the beast, on the, on the donkey, and then they were waving those palms, you know. And they were saying, save, O Lord, save, Hosanna. That's one of the meanings, save, O Lord. So notice what they're saying here. Cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God. They were crying salvation. They've been saved, folks. They realize their position in Christ. They're worshiping, praising God for what he's done for them. Which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So they're worshiping God the Father and the Lamb, Jesus as well. Because he's deity, folks. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders, the elders representing all of the saved from all from the Old Testament and New Testament era. And the four beasts, those that are there crying, holy, 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 all, all permanently, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. Why do you worship God? Why do we worship God? Why? Why did these people worship God? Worthy. He's worthy, isn't he? He's our Savior, right? Miss Helen, I didn't get your answer. Okay. He's worthy, isn't he? He's worthy. They realize he's worthy because they realize what he'd done for them. Now, this group of people were saved out of the tribulation time. They were in the middle of the tribulation time when they were saved, folks. This great and innumerable crowd were. It's what it says here. So they were worshiping God. They had reason to worship God. Do you have reason to worship God? We sure do, don't we, church? Just think about it. You know, we're not going to be here when all this tribulation is going on. If you've already received Christ, we're going to be taken out of this world. And, folks, I'm glad for that. We don't deserve to be. We don't deserve to be saved. But by his grace and mercy, we're saved, aren't we? Mm. And here's what they're saying as they worship. I mean, blessing and glory and wisdom. Thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever. So you see they're offering all these words of praise and honor and glory to the Lord, church, uh, because of who he is. You notice all these words are talking about who he is. We worship God because of who he is more than what he does for us, because he's worthy. Church, if he never blessed us with another blessing this side of eternity, he deserves our praise and is worthy of our praise forever and ever, isn't he? And one of the elders answered, saying to me, what are these? This is one of the elders that were representing the Old Testament saints and New Testament saints. They're saying, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Question marks. And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. So this is angel talking here. Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. If you applied blood to any kind of garments, it's going to come out white. Only the blood of Jesus does that, folks. <laughs> uh, Therefore are they before the throne of God, serve him day and night in his temple. Day and night, serving God. Hmm. Think about like the ladies in the New Testament, how they served Jesus, they ministered to Jesus. They sat at his feet during his teaching. They were there. They were there when he was on the cross. 
They went there to the tomb after he was buried in the tomb, right? They were serving, ministering. You know, Scripture says, or Jesus said, if you've done it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Okay? So they're serving the Lord there in heaven. All right. So let me get back sort of my outline here. First of all, we see the halting of the judgments, sealing of the 12,000 neighbor tribes, salvation of the innumerable crowd saved during tribulation, clothed in righteousness of Christ, washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. Mm. Boy, that's shouting ground there, isn't it? Number two, we see the worship in heaven performing God's presence forever and ever, those 144,000 in the great crowd around him. You know, that was, that's Jesus' desire. Uh, flip with me to John 17. You see me, you hear me refer to this so many times. It's the most powerful prayer that I know of in the Bible. That Jesus prayed especially, John 17. Of course, you know, <laughs> some people say, I don't want to pray out loud because I'm afraid I'll say the wrong thing. It doesn't matter about how much you pray, but it's the intent of the heart when you pray, isn't it? You remember the publican and the Pharisee? The old Pharisee prayed, oh, I'm glad I'm not like this old publican. You know, he's self-righteous. No publican just, he couldn't even approach with his head bowed and said, I forget what he say. Not even worthy, not even worthy. Mm. Mm. We're not, are we, church? Not in our own merits. John 17, look with me in verses. Let's look in verse 20 and following. This whole prayer here is powerful, but we're not read it all. Jesus was praying to the Father on behalf of his disciples and on our behalf. Neither pray I for these alone, talking about his disciples, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. You see the power of the testimony of the witnesses of the apostles? You see the power of the testimony of any believer? There's power because it's in the name of Jesus, right? That they all may be one. Okay, you see, Jesus is praying for oneness for all the believers. How in the world did the Jews and the Gentiles and the Samaritans, when they were saved in the New Testament, come together to worship? They couldn't before. Man, they were enemies of each other. That Holy Spirit of God, the common bond of the Holy Spirit of God in the believer brought them together, didn't it? Okay. Jesus said that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. They'll know we are Christians by the love we have for one another, folks. If we as Christians fight and quarrel and fuss among ourselves, how in the world is the world going to know that we're Christians? They'll say, we're better than you are. And I've had people tell me that. Say, man, I don't have to go to church because I know a lot of them hypocrites and all they do at that church is fight and fuss and quarrel. And I can do, this, I can do better than that at home, you know. And I'm sad to say that's true in some churches, isn't it? I thank God that we're not quarreling and fussing right now. Praise God for that. Okay. Verse 22, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. What is he talking about here? The glory that God gave Jesus? Same glory he's given us? Given us his disciples? What is that? What do you think of when you hear the word glory of God? Shekinah glory of God? What do you hear them think about What's inside you? Holy Spirit of God. That's what he's given us. You remember when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove and ascended on him and remained in him, see, on him, until he left, and then he sent the Holy Spirit back, see. He's glorified God by receiving the Holy Spirit and, and having him work inside him. So he just passed that glory on to us as believers, hasn't he? Okay, and the glory which thou gavest me, I've given them that they may be one even as we are one. So that's the way we're one with each other, folks, is a common bond of the Holy Spirit among us. Right? It's the only way we can be one. The disciples on that upper room before the day of Pentecost, they were in that upper room in prayer in one accord, folks. They had one focus in what they were about to receive. He said, remain there until you be endued with power from on high. They didn't know what that meant. The folks, when it came on them, they knew it, didn't they? Hmm. Okay, 
Verse 23, I and them and thou and me, the oneness. He's talking about the oneness here, isn't he, church? That they may be made perfect, complete in, in who? In what? In one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So we see the common bond of the Holy Spirit. Talked this morning about God being love. God is love, isn't he? He's the essence of all love. That's how we get our love is from him. Verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Folks, that's where these people are that are worshiping Revelation. They're in the presence of Almighty God in Jesus Christ the Lamb. See, Jesus' prayer fulfilled. That's what he was praying for, Father, that they may be where I am and where you are, okay? That they may behold my glory. Moses wasn't able to behold the full glory of God, was he? He could only see part. In your glorified body and your glorified eyes, folks, you're going to be able to see the full Shekinah glory of God and it won't hurt your eyes. Mm. Brighter than any sun, right? There won't be any need for the sun or the moon in heaven, will the church? Because Jesus is the light, all right? They may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. How could he love him before the foundation of the world? He was there. Jesus was God in the flesh. He was there, wasn't he, church? O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee. See, the Pharisees, the Jewish people didn't know Jesus, didn't know God. They thought they did. They kept referring to Father Abraham. They thought they were rightly connected to God because they were born under the lineage of Abraham. That doesn't make anybody right with God. If your parents were Christians, it doesn't make you a Christian, does it? Okay. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. What a prayer, church. What a prayer. Jesus prayed for us before the Father. What about that, Brother Rick? Isn't that something? Mm-hmm. I don't know of anybody I'd rather have pray for me than Jesus, do you? <laughs> I know some good prayer warriors I can call on, but uh, that's something. Okay. So there's worship in heaven. John 17 talks about that. As we go on there, 144,000 are in, in the presence too because they're there and this great numeral crowd are there. They're worshiping God. They came out of great tribulation. These, this innumerable crowd church went through some tough times here on planet earth because they weren't saved before the tribulation. They were saved in the midst of tribulation. They came out of tribulation, okay? Now they knew what it was like to suffer for Christ because they were in the presence of the great tribulation when God was pouring out his wrath on planet earth. But you see, God was protecting them during this time. He didn't take them out before it started because they were yet to become believers, okay? Took us out because we were believers if, we, if it happened right now, okay? So he said, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb by putting their faith in Jesus Christ and the cleansing power of the blood of the Lamb. That's what saved them, folks. And that's what gave them the white robes. Those your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Oh, they be like wool, they shall be as, as... We better go over there and see that Isaiah. and that Isaiah? Look in Isaiah with me along about chapter, early chapters. I forget exactly where it is. Isaiah. Let's see if I can find it right easy. Like Somebody might know where it is right off, but I think it's one of the first chapters of Isaiah. If I'm not mistaken... Yeah, chapter 1, verse 18. Isaiah. This ties in what we're talking about this morning, about Jesus giving the ultimatum to his churches. Tell them what's wrong and what's right in, in the churches. Saying, shape up, shape up, church, shape up. We need to hear that message today, shape up, church, don't we? 
be the church. He says, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. See, he's just been raking them over the coals about vain oblations and incense is abomination to me, the new moons and Sabbaths. They were going through the motions, but they didn't love God. They were doing it out of routine. Okay? They weren't taking care of people. Well, let's back up a few verses. Verse 10. Well, yeah, shucks. It's hard to stop anywhere. Well, we'll start with verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Wow. <laughs> Gracious, alive. He's comparing these people to the Sodomites. Give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Mm, boy, that's raking them over the coals, wasn't it? To what purpose is a multitude of your sacrifices unto me? They were sacrificing. They were doing all the things commanded in the law. Saith the Lord, I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight, delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of the goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, incense, vain, useless, empty. All their sacrifice and all their offerings was empty, without any love in it, without any purpose, without any reverence for God. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. See, incense was offered up by the priest like Zechariah did in the New Testament, offered it up on behalf of the prayers of the people. That's what it represented, the prayers of the people was going up. When it was offered in the right manner and the right love and devotion to God, it was a sweet aroma to his nostrils, see. Not so here, not so here. See, where was I? Verse 13. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. All, all their human efforts at trying to worship God were of no good. Mm. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. See, there are times when God hides his eyes from our prayers. He doesn't hear our prayers. He may hear them, but he's not going to respond to them. I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. You see, they were so like we talked this morning in Revelation. A time of injustice, time of balances out of weight, everything going wrong. I will not hear your hands are full of blood. Mm, what does this thing at the Lord? You know, I don't think God's saying come and present your case to me. He's saying come to me and let me let you know how, it, how it's going to be. You need to come before me and let me tell you what to do. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. See, I about misquoted it, didn't I? So you see, the Lord's telling them, says, if you'll come clean before me, if you'll turn away from your wicked ways and your, your so-called worship, you know, look at my own life and look at your life and say, Lord, is my devotion, my worship worthy to you? Is it acceptable or am I just going through the motions? That's a question you and I need to be asking ourselves, church. We're not any better than these people in the Old Testament, are we? We can get in the same boat, can't we? We come if we don't get our little cup full, we think we had not had worship. Folks, worship's not receiving. Worship is giving to God. Giving ourselves to Him in worship and devotion. The friend's benefit will be getting blessed, right? Of course, I know we come to church and we need some needs met don't we? we have prayers like but our prayers is just like it says here it's not going to be any good to god he's going to turn a deaf ear if we've got unconfessed sin in our lives i remember one time a long time ago we had something on the sign out here about about unanswered prayer i forget exactly what it was but somebody wrote me one of those anonymous 
letters, you know, in the mail and said, uh, I don't know where you get your theology, but said, God answers every prayer I pray. There's never a prayer that God doesn't answer. So I just put on the sign the next week, this passage right here in Isaiah. I didn't know who wrote the letter. They didn't put their name on it. But I showed them scripture to show that there are times that God won't answer your prayer, folks. There's another thing in scripture that tells about men. It says, if men are mistreating their wives, he'll not answer your prayer. Folks, that's serious business. Our prayers are serious business, and our life is our serious business. What's keeping us from getting hold of God's throne? Sometimes it's unconfessed sin in our lives. Could be anything. We're going through the motions sometimes. I think we're all guilty upon occasion, aren't we? We just come to church. We get down and say our little prayer in the morning or before bedtime and go about our business. And Anyway, I didn't mean get off on all that, but that wasn't in the script. Anyway, let's go back to Revelation. <laughs> okay, any comments, questions, or observations so far? Revelation 7. Let's go back to verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. See, there's a real temple in heaven, isn't there? And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. That's what we just read in John 17, wasn't it? Jesus said, I want to be with me. Jesus wants us to be in his presence, church. I don't deserve to be old rotten sinner as I am. Man, holy God, the closer I get to God, the more I see his holiness, church. The more I see my unworthiness. But I'm glad I'm worthy in God's sight because of what he did, not what I've done. Notice in verse 16, they shall hunger no more. What are they hungering for? What do these people hunger for on earth? Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be what? Filled, right? One of the Beatitudes, right? Had a hunger for God. They couldn't be satisfied totally. They kept on wanting more and more. You know, sort of like I give the illustration of ice cream. You know, I just can't get enough of that stuff sometimes. I know I'm not supposed to eat it, but it sure is good. You know, want more and more. Isn't that the way we are with God? Don't we want more and more of Him? He gets a hold of you. You get a taste of God. You want more and more of Him, folks. Mm. That's your hunger no more. What's He going to feed them with? Heavenly manna, right? Think about John chapter 4 when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. And the disciples went away to get food for them and came back. Jesus had been dealing with the woman, the Samaritan woman, hadn't he? Been telling her about the life-giving water. The disciples came back with food We'll just turn over there, John 4. I believe it's John 4, isn't it? it is. All right, we'll pull over there, John 4. Yeah. Now to look over at verse 30, 31. Well, verse, verse 30. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. And in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. See, they'd gone to get food. Here they brought it back to Jesus and said, Master, eat. We brought you some food. What did Jesus say? But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. <laughs> He's talking about that heavenly manner. Miss Manna, Miss Linda, wasn't he? Have you ever been just overwhelmed with the presence of God where you didn't even feel hungry? Isn't that a good place to be? Mm, I've been there a time or two. I'd like to be there more. Mm. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? He said, Somebody had been feeding this boy while he was gone. <laughs> Jesus said unto them, My meat is to what? Do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. What a statement. What a statement, church. Hmm. Say not ye there yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. Jesus saw the need of the people, didn't he, church? He had come. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Look at God's provisions. 
look at God's provisions for his people. Even when they get to heaven. See, he's going to be ministering to them. Because they've gone through great tribulation. They've been without food. They've been without spiritual food, church. What I understand, the Holy Spirit's been taken up. At the rapture. When he raptures out the church, where's the Holy Spirit at? He's in the hearts and lives of the believers. Taking us up leaves a void on planet Earth of the Holy Spirit of God. That's why it's going to be hard for people to be saved. Jesus said, unless the Father draws you, you cannot come unto me. So we'll get into that later on. About There's going to be some witnessing going on on planet Earth during the tribulation time and during the time the old devil's wreaking his havoc. All right. Look at God's provision. Is he your provider? Is he your sustainer? Isn't he? Isn't he? What would you have without God? Oh, preacher, I've worked hard all my life. I'm a self-made man or woman. Man, I've worked hard. That's where all this stuff came from. Rightfully so, but what if God wasn't giving you the health to do it? What if he didn't give you the mind to do it? What if he didn't provide you a place for work? See, we're dependent on the Lord, folks. You can put in every resume in the world, at every business in the world. God doesn't lead you. Life will end up in trouble. He provides. Verse 17, for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. <laughs> we're going to be partaking of that holy manna of Jesus himself. John 15 talks about abiding in the vine, right? That's where we get our nourishments from Jesus, from the Lamb, right? Mm. Shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of water. That's what he told this Samaritan woman. We just, in those earlier verses, wasn't he? If you'd ask of me, I'd give you living water. You'd never thirst again. She said, boy, I'd like that. I don't have to gum this well anymore. Right? Because she is a woman of ill repute. She could only come to the well during certain times of the day, from what I understand. Because she was sort of an outcast, even among her Samaritan friends. Okay? She was there in the time of day the women usually weren't at the well divine appointment <laughs> divine appointment church mm. Jesus must needs go through Samaria for this one woman and all those people who believed in Jesus through her testimony and then they believed because they saw Jesus and experienced him themselves and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes mm -mm, mm -mm. no more tears no tears in heaven, no sorrows given. All will be glory in that land. There'll be no, I forget the rest of the words. <laughs> Wipe away our tears. What brings tears to your eyes? What are some of the things that bring tears to your eyes here on earth's earth? Missing a loved one, right? Yeah. Shed tears because we loved them, right? Yeah, what else brings tears to her eyes? Seeing the world go to where it's going. That's right, brother. Their kids, grandkids, yeah. What they've got to go through if the Lord tears is coming. God's going to wipe away those tears, brother, sister. Looking forward to that. The way I see that, in order for us not to shed any more tears, I think you've got to take away our memory of the hurt things that hurt us down here. I hear people say, uh, people in heaven are looking at us. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that would really make them sad. Right, right. Well, that, I don't know. I don't know for sure, but I know there's going to be a certain time when those wipes are tear, tears are wiped. And there may be some. I'm not sure, brother. But, there's a lot we don't understand about heaven, is there? But I know it won't be any disappointments when we get there. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to wipe away our tears, take away those memories of the things that hurt us. It's hard to see our world in the condition it's in, doesn't it? It does. It grieves your heart to see the way our nation's been heading for the last many years. The leaders of our nation don't care about the people. All they care about is power and money, greed. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, you back it all up. And you see the issue starts and the breakdown of the home, right? Mm, breakdown of the church. Mm-mm. But I'm glad one day God's going to wipe those tears away, church. Looking forward to that, aren't you? He's just. He's doing this because he can do it and he's, it's what he's doing, church. Just think about over in Genesis chapter 6, wasn't it, where he looked on the earth and it repented God that he made man? What in the world is he thinking today? Hmm. Mm-mm. But for his grace. But for his grace. Mm-mm. He's going to make things right. It'll be justice. Mm. Mercy, grace, and justice. Mm. His grace and mercy is there for those who will believe and accept. But his justice is there for those who reject. Sad part about it, isn't it? Mm. Folks, we've got a lot to look forward to. We know that this group of people here came out of tribulation. We see the 144,000 came out of tribulation. They're there before the throne, before the Lamb, worshiping God in the midst of all this tribulation because they've been taken out of it. Folks had reason to worship God. We've got reason to worship God and praise Him. We need not despair. We, The church need not despair, church. We can have tears for this condition, but we know the end of the process. We know He's coming again. It may be soon. Mm. Amen. Amen. Comments, questions, or observations? Could be, of course, I know that's going to take place at the judgment seat of Christ when all of our works are displayed before us. That's where those tears are going to be, and it ties in here as well, I'm sure. But, uh, yeah, we'll see all those. There are many times I've missed opportunities to share the gospel, and I realized it just a few minutes after, after I had the opportunity. Lord, I just missed that opportunity. I'm too busy with what I was doing. Mm-hmm. I've always prayed, God, if I don't get another opportunity to put somebody in that person's life to do what I was supposed to have done. Right. God's good, isn't he, church? Even in the midst of tribulation, he's still good. He's still on his throne, coming back soon, and he will make all things right. All right. All hearts and minds clear as can be. All right. If you would stand, we'll be dismissed. Mm Mm-mm. Lord, we are so thankful for your mercy and your grace and your great love for us. Thank you that you are a just God as well as an all-loving God. We can trust you. Help us to be faithful in your calling upon us as believers that we might be busy about the Father's work and see the world around us in a way that we can be used as your vessels, Father, instead of condemning May we be those who can share good news in the time of desperation. So we do praise you and all that you are and all you do. And dismiss us in your care and just put your heads around my brothers and sisters. We do love you and praise you and we do ask it all.